Welcome to the Outpost. Uh, my name is Andy Bayo. Uh, I'm co-organizer and co-founder of XOXO, a festival held in September in, uh, here in Portland, and uh, the co-founder of the Outpost, which is the building that you are in right now. Uh, if you've never been here before, it is a shared workspace for independent artists of all kinds. We have filmmakers, musicians, tabletop game designers, comics uh, artists, illustrators, writers, uh, creative coders, and of course, video game uh, designers and programmers. Um, and, uh, and we run events here. We run, uh, we run a series of game postmortems, of which this is one of them, and uh, among many other uh, things. And if you're interested, you can follow us on Twitter at OutpostPDX. Um, I want to thank uh, Pick Squad uh, for uh, offering to stream uh, this talk, which is awesome. It is live right now, and if you need the link and want to tweet it out, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, it's on the Pick Squad account, um, and they are incredible. And if you want to back their Patreon, I strongly encourage it. I do as well. You could go to PickSquad.com for that. If you want to learn more about the outpost uh, and you're interested in working here, absolutely by all means uh, sign up. We're uh, we're at outpost. Uh, uh, pdx.com. Um, and with that, uh, I would just like to say briefly that uh, there are drinks over here for free if you are interested. We have some beer and cider. And uh, that's about it. Um, I want to welcome uh, one of our members uh, who I've wanted to have him speak uh, since the moment that he stepped in the, uh, the door here. And, uh, and I'm very excited to have him talk about his work. Uh, please, big hand for Fernando Romalo. It's Fernando Ramacho. You learned it? Yeah, I'm kidding. Uh, uh, hi, uh, I'm Fernando. Um, I made a game called Panoramico, and um, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what went on in the past three and a half years of my life while I was making it and releasing it and recovering from it. Uh, and yeah, I want to tell you about what it is. And um, yeah, I want, to, I, I want to tell you about it because uh, I made it with uh, David Kaniga. He made the music for it, and he made the music for Proteus. Um, and we made it in a way uh, that I don't see a lot of games being made, or a lot of projects uh, being made that way. Uh, we, we found this sort of workflow that I want to see more of, hopefully. And I also have a lot of feelings. Uh, and you look like nice people, so I want to. I want to share my feelings with you. Uh, and you also kind of like help me bring a little bit of closure to, to what went on. Uh, I'm not going to do a Q&A, but uh, feel free to have beer with me after. Um, so Panoramico looks a little bit like this. Oh, yeah, this is the title. Uh, in Panoramical, you have this array of musical landscapes, you, these abstract spaces where uh, you have several controls. Um, you have nine different types of controls. And everything you change changes both the visuals in that landscape and the music. So you kind of. Um, it doesn't have any goals or any objectives set by the game. Um, so you're kind of like exploring these spaces uh, at your own volition. And you can move on whenever you want. The game doesn't rush you or push you in any way and lets you zone out and sort of uh, find these little moments of beauty whatever that means. Uh, oops, sorry about that. And 
there's like 10 different environments uh, or more. We work with several artists that made some. Uh, we released it last year. It's out on Steam, on PC and Mac. And yeah, um, you can play with a with keyboard and mouse, with the games controller. You can also play with a MIDI controller, which is one of the first times I, uh, I've seen a game do that. Um, and yeah, I'm going to show you a little bit of, of the process of making it, and, and then move on about what happened after. This is one of the first scenes that we made um, that pretty much looked that way since the beginning, more or less. So Panoramico started as a little prototype. I was staying with my friend David, who made the music for it. And uh, basically what happened is we, it was after GDC in 2012. And uh, he had a, this MIDI controller laying around. It had a lot of uh, sliders and knobs. And I've never seen a controller like that before, uh, at least that I could play with. And what I did is I started I plugged in the computer. I started playing around with it as an interface for games, which sounded interesting, like having a bunch of like analog controls change the rules of a game or an experience or something. So at the same time, uh, David started making music with the same inputs. So we made a couple of prototypes where he made music, I made a little game, and then we run it together side by side. So the game had like dynamic audio, but it was like fake. Um, and this is what the prototype looked like. It was, uh, the idea was you were changing the features of a planet and you were orbiting the planet and I had the idea of making like a simulation where you change kind of uh, the temperature of the planet and it changes the way it looks. Uh, maybe you have little creatures on it or something like that. Um, but uh, after making the prototype that I, I didn't like find it that interesting. But then I added this control that changed the skies, like the field of view of the camera making all the stars kind of warp. And I thought that, that looked nifty, but it was also kind of like a cheap trick. It wasn't very elaborate, so I didn't think it was that interesting. But David was super excited about it, and I would just play with that slider. Um, and yeah, I think his excitement made me feel like there might be something here. Uh, and long story short, Indicate was coming up, this conference in LA, and they were looking for projects. And I tried working on this as sort of like an installation piece, but got stuck. And I wasn't that interested in the project. And I got anxious about, uh, I don't know, making a thing that all my peers would look at. And um, I don't know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't work on it. And then uh, we got in, a, a friend saw it, and he was organizing, Robin Arnold, he was organizing the Night Games, which is a party there with games. And he, like, we basically, he told us to make, make it a thing to show at Night Games. So we didn't have to go through any, like, I didn't have to make something that would impress a bunch of judges and go through the, this process of um, selection. And instead, I could just focus on making something that look, looks cool, that works at, an, at this one event in particular, and didn't need to be a product or anything. So I started kind of planning this, um, working on this planet thing as an installation piece. And I had all these ideas and all these sketches about uh, the way the environment would flow and all like shapes that you can control, uh, all these sketches about it would like move horizontally and you would have like highways and the sun would change and whatever. 
And then by the time I had to actually sit down and implement it, like none of this stuff like worked. Everything seemed super complicated, and I only had two weeks to work on it. Uh, and I got super stuck, super nervous, and I couldn't work. And then like a week before the event, I I kind of like I got too anxious that I just uh, something clicked, and I was like, I'm just gonna do whatever. I'm just gonna put something on the screen. It's not gonna have any gameplay, any interactions, anything. It's just gonna be like a bunch of like objects changing to the control, and that's it. And then I'm like, David's gonna make music for it, and then I'm gonna move on and do something that I actually like put work on. Uh, yeah, like I, I even I, I tried designing all these guides for David to make the music off, and uh, I don't know. I had this all these elaborate sort of like sort of design document, but not really. And uh, none of the, I didn't use any of this. Like, it wasn't until I actually sat down with Unity and started playing around with things that I, I started making stuff. So planning, planning didn't work for Panoramical at all. Uh, Indicate was asking for a, an, an image to put on the website of what the game would look like, and I had like nothing. So I opened Unity and I just placed some particles and, and I kind of made a mock-up of what the game would look like in my mind and I sent it and that's, that was on the website of like, here, look at this game, it's gonna be here when there was nothing running. Um, but that actually was pretty useful on, like, on, on, on directing how the game was actually gonna look like. Uh, and this, this was that kind of fake mock-up and this is what the first scene looks like now, so it was kind of close. Um, there's, this, there's this thing that happens when making games where developers keep finding the things that are broken, especially when you're making graphics, um, and they always break in beautiful ways. Um, and what happens is people acknowledge that there's beauty in this broken system that renders images. There's something there that makes people tweet about it or show it to people and say, look, this is pretty cool. We don't really understand why it makes us feel like it's really cool, but it, it does. And then what usually happens is developers will fix the bug make the thing look the way they want it to look, and move on. But what if, what if you make a game about that? What if you use this emergence, immersion uh, brokenness as an aesthetic or an art choice? Um, and this is kind of, this is, these are the brush strokes of uh, games, I feel, like if you let, this is what the medium looks like. I, I, I started liking the idea of making the computer draw what you wanted it to draw, and more, like less and less, and, and more like letting 3D graphics be what they wanna be. So I wanna show you a little bit of how a scene in Paranomical works. Um, Oof. The it's it, when you play panoramical, you have all these controls and all these interconnecting elements in the visuals and the graphics and then the, the graphics and the audio and everything. But it's actually really simple in the back. Uh, for example, I have here a like a really simple scene, right? Where I just have light and a plane, and what's cool about Unity in particular is that you can drag any, any parameter and see the effect right away. So for example, if I change the rotation of the sun, I get this nice little sunset. So what Panoramical is about and what making Panoramical was about is the experience of fiddling with parameters because it feels good. Uh, 
So for example, if I, I have this little script where you say, uh, take a value from the controls, the vertical axis of one of the controls, and change this little thing right here, the, the angles in X, right? From zero to 20, right? And then when you play the game, everything breaks. That control is going to now change. Like you can, you made a sunset, and you're controlling it with nothing, right? And then, if you add a looping audio to that, uh, and then change, for example, a filter with the same control. You get this super dynamic audio visual change that feels very good, but it's actually really, really simple. And then you repeat that times 100, fill out all the sliders, all the controls, and then you have a scene. Uh, so the process of putting up an angle was finding all these interesting interactions uh, and giving the player the control to change them uh, and sort of fake a space and environment with it through the sounds and the visuals. But there's no space. It's like everything's fake, right? Everything's placed in front of the cameras for you to feel that there's an environment around you, but there's not. And the interactions aren't complex at all. They're just very, very simple, except there's a lot of them. And most of the time was spent just making those interactions interesting enough, right? Like changing the sky color in a way that worked with this one other element and with this one other element. So uh, the, the tweaking became the, the complicated part. Um, So then, uh, after that, it made sense to make it a project and work on it for a while and like make a little something that we can release and sell and uh, like people can play at home or whatever. Um, and that's where like that's where it became really complicated. Um, we had this one scene, and then we were going to, OK, we make more scenes like this, more environments that you can play with. And they all have different visuals and different sounds. And then you, you know, once you have those, you need a way to connect them and move through them in a way that would sort of make sense in and what makes sense in an abstract game. Like the, it, the game is not about anything. The game is like, there's no story. so. Um, and then, you know, I wanted to have an introduction to the experience that would set the mood for what the rest of the game would be. And then once you play through everything, I wanted some closure, some sort of ending that would also make sense within the structure of everything else. Uh, but what the structure was or what made sense for the game, I didn't know from the start at all. It was just adding stuff to it until it made sense. So for example, uh, I wanted a way to move between all the, uh, all the spaces. But one of the restrictions that I set for myself is I, I didn't want any text at all. Like If the game is going to be about manipulating colors and shapes and sounds, uh, it makes no sense to me that there will be like UI and text telling you things. It needs to be like the purest form of uh, shape, right? Uh, and that, that ended up being like, text is really, really useful for communicating things. Uh, so then it became a game of how do you explain things uh, 
without any tropes, I wanted to avoid video game tropes at any cost. And so, for example, like if you want to move through different scenes, you want to make like a level selection, a map, a, a path, something that makes sense in, in like interactive art to move between things. Uh, and I mean, this this is what the the selection of scenes looks like right now, where you have this dial. Uh, you move the controls and you choose which scene you want to go to. And that was one of the problems. The menu had to work with all the controls. Like It had to make sense for the game. It had to work with the keyboard and the mouse controls. It had to work with the MIDI controller. It had to work with the games controller. And I want to make one menu. I didn't want to, I didn't want to make like five menus. Uh, so I, I, this is the first version of moving from one scene to another, uh, where you hold this button and the scene kind of starts becoming fluid. Uh, you can still play the scene while this is happening. Um, and then the place you were at becomes this sort of infinite space, which is a repetition of itself in this fluid, abstract space that has no beginning or no end. And I thought that was really cool. Um, and then the way you would move between a scenes is you will go to the space and then you hit the keyboard and then move to the next one. But even though it looked really cool, people had no idea how to use it. Uh, and then what I ended up doing is I kind of at the last minute I added the dial menu with the lines and I kind of gave up and said, okay, it's going to look like a level selection. It's fine. Uh, and what happened is the, the old system is still there. This is just built on top of that. So everything that you see around it is that same fluid space, except you can't see it at all. And the old space had also every single control in the game, the 18 different controls affect the way it looks and it sounds. But now it's lost. And I like the other one better, but you, I also needed to let people navigate the space. So um, I had to give up on a, a bunch of things like that. Then I, uh, I was thinking of like, uh, uh, you know, making the selection uh, a thing where you're navigating through all these dimensions, and every space is a different dimensions, and this is the the selection is the space where everything collides. And I was looking at weird diagrams and quantum physics stuff that I didn't understand. And uh, I don't know. I made it very complicated for myself, uh, where a, a menu would have been OK as well. Uh, I also wanted an intro sequence. Uh, and what I ended up doing is this. Is there a video of it? No. Uh, I made this very elaborate introduction scene with this fluid movements in 2D that is choreographed and is three minutes long and it's the only choreographed scene in the game and it has all these flashing colors and shapes that are unpredictable and it's beautiful uh, and also what ended up happening is people got really confused because uh, it was it's a very mellow game and the introduction is really on your face flashing colors that's the first thing you see even some people got, uh, there was a bug where you can't pause the introduction because the music would fall out of sync. So people would, the first thing they see is flashing colors, and they would try to pause it, and they couldn't. People freaked out and closed the game. And like, I don't know, it's just, I had no way of predicting that. Um, and then there was uh, this outro where this was a, like kind of at the last part of development where I was very tired. I ended up just reusing everything I had and made a sequence where the entire game starts to slowly collapse into infinity. And uh, that ended up working pretty well. Um, but also it was kind of 
too much for a lot of people. Um, one of the other things that I wanted from the start is, you know, the game was designed for the MIDI controller, so people at home should be able to play with any MIDI controller because MIDI controllers are interesting interfaces and they're not used for games and they should be. So the game should support every MIDI controller in existence. Uh, but you should also play with your keyboard and your mouse in case you don't have any, any controllers. Uh, and then it'd be nice to sit on the couch and play with a games controller. Um, and it'd be great to give people that make visuals a way to connect to the game through this interface called OSC. Um, so they can make cool, weird interfaces for it. And there needs to be a way to teach people how to use all these controls. And I don't want to use any text. So <laughs> uh, explaining the controls and they are becoming uh, one of the hardest things. And one, one of the things that I rewrote, uh, this, I ended up giving up and writing a tutorial which I didn't want to, but um, you know, I wanted to not use any text. Uh, I spent a lot of time sketching this minimal graphical way to explain controls with no words that felt intuitive, um, and it would you would be able to switch controls. Uh, this was one of the I don't even know what's going on like. I was trying, this was one of the first tutorials that I made. I wanted to have a sort of view of yourself playing the game and make it meta. And then I had these 3D hands. One of them was holding a mouse. And then I had to make another hand hold the keys that you're holding. And the first problem that I bumped into was, what happens if you press the C? and the M at the same time. What does the hand do? And then I'm spending an entire afternoon coding movements for a hand, and it didn't even look that good. So I, I went through a lot of these kind of sort of rabbit holes, right? Uh, and it also had to have tutorials for every single type of controls that you could use, right? Like, you're going to use knobs, you're going to use keys, you're going to use a games controller, and every single step of the tutorial has to work with every single control. And what if you switch, you start working, you start playing with the keyboard, and then you realize you can use a gamepad, and you grab a gamepad. What happens? Does the tutorial change? At the same time, it does right now, and that was a pain in the ass, but, um, you know, wow. And this is what the, what the tutorial ended up looking like at the end. Just here's what you do, do it, that's it. Like simple, nothing else. And I, I gave up and I used text and uh, it worked. And I was showing the game around and a bunch of friends that were Aris were super into it and they were like, oh, I want to make a scene with you guys. and. Uh, that sounded really cool, and all all my favorite artists were wanted to work with me, and that was incredible. And I wanted to allow Panoramical to be this uh, like space for artists to do something experimental that they wouldn't do otherwise. Um, and I we ended up we made three scenes with collaborators that ended up being incredible. This is a scene with uh, Bayan and Mr. Div. There was always someone making the graphics and making the sound. And the idea was to give them the same input as the game, but let them do whatever they wanted. Um, and Richard Flanagan and those one made this incredible cityscape scene. Uh, my friend George Buckingham, Yukio Kalio made this ex extremely incredible glitchy CD that every single time I played it looks different. Uh, and that was incredible. That that you know that elevated the game to like miles beyond what what I planned from the start. Uh, but it was also really really a, a lot of work. I really complicated. I had to first of all like be a producer and keep up with everyone and make sure we would make everything at the, at the right time. Uh, we didn't have we didn't know what the game was about. And we didn't have the tools to give them. You know, uh, here's the Unity project. Just work on it. Uh, 
I spent like two years emailing back and forth and saying like we don't have we're not yet ready to work with you guys yet. Uh, and then we had to figure out like if we're gonna charge for the game, uh, we want to give them a revenue share because we can't pay them right now. And then like we came this really complicated mess. And there was also a lot of stuff that uh, I had. It added a bunch of work for myself, right? Like. Um, the some of the artists weren't games developers, which is great. I didn't want like I, I wanted more different kinds of people to add to the game. Uh, but that meant I had to code a lot of things myself that were not what I was doing with the with the normal game. I had to go to a lot of specific special things for the scenes to work. Um, and yeah, and I don't know. I think, in retrospect, I I wish that we had waited to collaborate, and then once we had a game that actually worked and we knew what it worked and what didn't, then open it up to people. Um, and yeah, I also wish we had been more diverse in our in our team. And uh, but by the time I realized that, it was too late to bring in new people, and it was already a very complicated project. Um, but and then there was there were so many other things, right? Like uh, this all happened while I was showing the game at a bunch of festivals around the world, which was incredible. Like I managed to go around the world and show my cool abstract project, and people actually liked it. And that it also didn't leave a lot of time to actually work on the game. Um, I there was there were things like. Uh, People really like to take screenshots and share them, share them on Twitter. So what if you can take a screenshot inside the game and log into Twitter inside the game and then share screenshots with the, just a button? Uh, and what if you can record a video and then make a looping GIF and then you post that to Twitter from inside the game? And you know this is like a week of work and then another week of work and that just keeps going, keeps adding to, st to stuff like menus, like making a configuration menu to set up your MIDI controller and set up your keyboard. And what if you have a keyboard in German where the C key, which is one of the ones they're using, is actually the Y and they're swapped and do I detect which language your computer is set up? And, uh, and and I think one of my sort of regrets is that making the content, the actual scene, the scenes, the fun part of tweaking values and playing around with, with stuff, was probably 40% of making the actual game. Uh, the rest was adding padding to it and make it into a thing that people could play at home and didn't break. Uh, so that meant that I wasn't having actual fun most of the time. Uh, which kind of sucks. Then there was money. Uh, we got funding by IndieFund from the start, which was great. They really believed in us and sort of made a, an experiment out of how do you bring an installation piece into an actual game that you sell on Steam. Uh, and I, I made a lot of mistakes throughout the process of not uh, not keeping them communicated, uh, not keeping them on the loop a lot, uh, especially in the hardest part of development when things were taking way longer than I thought they would. Uh, it, you know, it was my first time managing a huge project like this, and I was uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, I always thought I would get it done in the next two months, and then there was always something else. And uh, that meant that I was like, I got some funding, and then I ran out of that funding, and then I had to ask for more money and explain how I was gonna really get it right this time, and then I ran out of that money, uh, and you know, and I was always broke. I was always trying to stretch the little money that I had as much as possible and trying to make this get this done, and at one point it was too late to give up, right? Like you already. I already made all this stuff, and it's nowhere near finished, but I can't not finish it. Um, Polytron ended up uh, offering to help out and just make it happen, just like give me the money that I needed to finish it in the next few months. And um, so that was incredible, and that uh, like ended up making it really making it happen. Um, but still, it was. Uh, 
stretching it as much as possible um, to, to be able to finish it. And at the same time being overwhelmed with figuring out contracts with everyone that we were collaborating with and recouping investment with the sales and who gets money first. And there's like all these uh, two, two uh, groups of people giving us money and recouping that money. And uh, so I ended up uh, seeking help from Adam and Becca Feldman, who run this company called Finchy. And they were, they were incredible. And you know they helped us figure out, basically take care of all the business stuff, uh, marketing, and also made us feel like we were in a team instead of just me and David trying to make this broken thing happen. Um, and yeah, that was, that was incredible. And it really made it happen. Um, so yeah, with all these people involved and this money and everything, and you know, at the point, at one point, I was with sort of wishing that I kept it as an installation piece that I showed at a bunch of events and kept it as that. Um, but it was too late. Um, and yeah, and I, I, then at one point, I I run out of the rest of the funding, and there was still like it was still not done, and. Uh, you know, my partner is incredible. He, he he ended up like taking over and letting me finish the game while he paid the bills, which was not the plan at all. Like, and it was he was eating out of these reserves to make his own game, and um, he was incredibly supportive. But that also you know added to the stress of like how am I not finishing this and how how am I in this situation? Um, by the time we were sort of done, we also had no idea how to price it. Um, you know, it's, we aimed at selling it at Steam, and, but it's not really a game that people from Steam would buy, but also we didn't know how to reach the people that would buy it, uh, that would come to, I don't know, a festival and play it, uh, but they never, they would never buy anything online. Uh, so, you know, then I ended up adding a bunch of features, moving a bunch of features to a pro version, sort of in the last week, right? Uh, and selling a pro version that had a bunch of things for visual artists to use it as visuals, right? Uh, that ended up making like 30% of the project, of the profit, uh, even though it was a less minute thing. And yeah, and then, it came out, uh, it sold at $10, and it basically made, uh, up until now, it made 30K. It had an investment of 45. And after it, after it was done in September last year, I, I didn't see any profits for, from it for seven months. And the only profit that I saw were uh, I had a check in April for seven hundred dollars, and um, yeah, this was a thing that uh, that I worked on for three years, put everything on it, and I wasn't making it for the money, right? But um, not not seeing like any change in my life at all, even to pay rent for a month or two and slow down and think about the next thing was uh, was kind of hard. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about feelings. What I'm what I'm hoping to sort of communicate is like I, I don't want like I'm not meaning to complain, and, and, but I'm hoping to communicate just how much work, how much work it was. It was, you know every day like every day it wasn't like I, I i was working on it on the side and every once in a while i would make something this was my full-time thing every single day for what two and a half years three years it was every all that i was thinking about and all that i was working on and um Yeah, and then it was September. I was in my bedroom, eight in the morning, and I 
pushed the button and I, I released it. It was done. Uh, it, it felt, um, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't feel anything when it came out, right? Like I was numb. And what happened right after is, um, you know, a bunch of friends in Twitter getting a lot of good recognition for it. Um, a, a couple of days went by and uh, I was seeing all these people playing with it, seeing them post the screenshots online on Twitter. The thing that I wrote for with Twitter posting actually worked. Uh, I wasn't getting a bunch of emails with everything broken. Uh, the game was working, people were playing it, people were enjoying it, it felt great. Uh, but I was also very, very tired. I was exhausted. And um, what happened after is um, I, nothing, nothing changed, right? I, I, I still had to pay rent, and I didn't see any money from it. And um, I started to become stuck. And I would say depressed, but I, it's kind of like, it, I, wasn't, I wasn't depressed in this way of uh, I couldn't get out of bed or anything. I, I just didn't care. Uh, I was like, sort of like blocked, like the, the idea, the mere idea of sitting down in front of the computer and make another thing or uh, even do contract work and try and make something simple, just, uh, just my body didn't, like I was done. Um, and you know, like the question was like, why, why would I try and do something? Why, why would I try and do this again and why, uh, why do anything really at all if, um, especially if, let's say I try to make another game and if this is the, is this the kind of people that I'm, that I'm making my art for? Even if it's not, this is the response that I'm gonna get, uh, you know, uh, and what else can I do? I don't, I don't know how to do anything else. I don't, I don't know how to navigate the world of art. And I don't know how to do business and work for a company. And um, am I, okay, do I make games about this feeling right now? Do I make games about the hardship of it or my kinks or, if I do that, I'm going to have a 13-year-old call the SWAT team to my house. What's going to happen? Um, and I can, you know, I could rationalize it all and say, oh, it's just, I'm just, I just need a break. I just need a break for a couple of months. My spark is going to come back. And I just got to give it time. And I did, and I gave it time. But uh, the spark didn't come, right? Like, I was still, I still didn't want it get any work, I, I didn't want to sit down in front of the computer. And I was super proud of, of the game, I was super proud of uh, all the work that I did and everything that came after and uh, you know all the people that were playing, you know, all the people that I got to work with. Uh, it's just like, what, what do you do after? Um, and it's not about, it's not even about it not making money. It's, uh, I don't know, I don't know what it is, right? It's just like, I don't know. What what do you do? Why 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 do anything? Um, so my conclusion from Panoramical is you should uh, tweak around things and like the dispose of your conception preconceptions about game mechanics. Who needs them? You can make a game about nothing. You can game and make make a game about beauty and abstract graphics and sound. And also, why do anything, really? Um, that's it. 
Uh, and now, you get to hear me talk about what's coming next. Uh, I managed to get out a, bit, a little bit of my rut. It still comes and goes, but I, I've been doing some contract work, and I've been uh, slowly starting to get more excited about making stuff. Uh, and what I'm working on right now is I'm doing some, I'm doing water for some friends, which is fun. And also we're gonna do a little bit of a re-release re or rebirth or birthday DLC or something like that, uh, where we're gonna add uh, scenes from Panoramical that got cut, that didn't make it, but they're still pretty fun and pretty cool. And developer commentary where you can hear us talk over the game, but also mix the commentary at the same time with your controls and pitch bend our voices, and it looks really funny. Uh, and uh, all the tools that I use to make Panoramical and make uh, those like connections between things are gonna be released as a Unity package that anyone can do download and make a Panoramical scene and export it in a way that the game can read it, and then we're gonna have mods, and then everyone can make a panoramical scene, and a bunch of cool friends uh, wanna make stuff for it, and that's really, really exciting. Um, and yeah, and finally, the cool stuff folder. Throughout making panoramical, I, I just put stuff in a folder, cool stuff that happened throughout development, and that made me keep going because they were really cool. Cool stuff happened. Uh, and I'm gonna show you. This is Panoramical running through a VJ software uh, that my friend Wiley did visuals for a theater play and he needed a moving landscape and he didn't wanna like code one from scratch. So I implemented this library to reroute video from Panoramical and he used it for visuals and it was incredible. And it, it's beautiful. Um, this was one, like this was the first time that I, I coded moving terrain. I was very proud that I figured out how to code terrain that morphs to your controls. Uh, we made custom controllers. Some, a friend, Bern, Brendan Byrne from New York, uh, built uh, custom controllers for Panoramical that we sold with the game, and they sold out in like a day, of course. Uh, and that meant we we got to design what controller we want for the game, and we could do anything. Uh, so we did, and some of them are incredibly weird, like what's going on down there? I, I don't know. Uh, we got to design a faceplate that would get printed on top of the the control, and I got to you know decide like how do you communicate that the controls are linked together, and uh, I haven't done this sort of things in school, so that was fun. Uh, he built it from scratch, and there was someone making a physical thing for my game. That's incredible, it was so fun. Uh, we did visuals for it once, and connected it to a bunch of different uh, MIDI controllers, and that was cool. Um, I don't even know what's going on there. I, we showed it at a bunch of events everywhere in the world. It was incredible. And one of my favorites one was what, this GDC, uh, where David went to Target and bought, just came out, came back with a bag. And the bag had everything wonderful and colorful and beautiful. And we decorated the, the GDC, the, this business place with colors and Play-Doh and like scented with cherry that was would stick, get stuck in your fingers. And uh, we made a tutorial with Play-Doh and uh, it was incredible. And it all ended up in the trash after. But it was so cool. Uh, someone made a badger controller, a controller that's a badger, and you rub its own belly with his hands and it changes the panoramical scene. What? What? Uh, incredible. Someone made his 
own controller and projected the game at a party on the side of a shipping container. What? Uh, every single screenshot that you took from the Unity editor view is its own piece of beautiful abstract art. There's endless, endless sources of broken textures that look incredible. Um, every single time, like broken shaders that break in beautiful ways. Uh, I don't know, stuff, glitches, uh, shaders that are taking like noise from a texture and breaks and looks like marble. Uh, the scene had. I, I, at the end, I taught myself how to draw lines, and then I wanted to make the entire game be about lines, but it was too late to change everything. So now I have to make another game about lines. That stuff is cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, this is what a scene looks like when it's playing. And I kind of want to frame it and put it on my wall. Uh, this scene uses hundreds of light sources, and it made Unity crash all the time. And my friend Robert scolded me about using too many lights. Uh, but it was also pretty beautiful. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm you know, just after all this stuff, I'm still super proud and happy that I went through it. I would change probably half of the way I, I, I did things. I was copied down and everything. But uh, you know, there's no way you can, you can plan for that stuff. But hopefully, I don't know, hopefully we'll, it made people want to make stuff the way some other stuff made me want to make stuff. Um, so yeah, that's Pyramical. <laughs>